All right, so I'm going to get started for real. I'm Jessica from SmartPack. I have a lot to get through today, so I'm going to talk really fast, and if there's anything I do not get to, please come visit me afterwards. I'll have time to stay or at the SmartPack booth in the trade show. If I could have you know one thing about SmartPack, if you don't know anything about us already, even though we sell supplements, you're not going to hear us say that supplements are the solution to all the world's health problems or any problems. We recognize that you guys are the most critical part of um, maintaining of health in the horses and supplements and nutrition for that matter are just one piece of the puzzle and where nutrition um, is a factor that you need help with we would love to help you and we'd love to help your clients but we're not here to say supplements are are more important than your work because that's just not true so I said all right if I had to have these guys walk away with ten things about horse nutrition and feeding horses that would be really useful and practical what would those be Frankly, it was a little bit ambitious for 20 minutes, so I'm going to talk really fast. Um, and some of you might have been in my morning session where I covered some of this in more depth, so I may um, breeze over those stuff, that stuff a little bit. So the most important takeaway is that horses are designed uh, as what we call trickle feeders. They're supposed to eat a little bit all the time. Their digestive system and their metabolism <coughs> is designed for taking in, in particular, roughage or forage as the foundation of their diet and, and eating up to 17 hours a day in a, in a natural situation. So horses that don't get enough roughage in the diet or have to go for extended periods of time with nothing to munch on with what we call fasting periods um, are definitely at increased risk for digest digestive issues like ulcers and colic. Ideally, the horse owner should be feeding 1 to 2% of the horse's body weight in roughage per day. So if it's a 1,000 pound horse, that's 10 to 20 pounds that need to come from hay, maybe a combination of hay, pasture, some alfalfa cubes. I mean, it can be a mix of those things. But about um, 10 to 20 pounds for your average size horse does need to be a, a forage source. I really like these slow feeder style hay bags and hay nets. They have small holes, small openings that make the horse work a little bit harder, um, especially if you have an easy keeper like my horse, who doesn't, I, I'm trying to make his hay last a little bit longer. It kind of makes him work at picking out those little pieces of hay. Also good for their brain, keeps them occupied, really mimics that kind of natural grazing behavior where they're meandering and eating a little bit all the time. Eating a little bit and nibbling and working at the hay also has the horse swallowing a little bit of saliva throughout the day. Saliva has bicarbonate, which helps neutralize some of the stomach acid, and it's good for horses who have ulcery type issues as well. So there's a lot of reasons that this is a really good idea. I use the one in the middle, it's a busy horse hay bag, which I really, really like. Okay, this is the boring slash part, slash intimidating part that people don't like, talking about the, the details of these nutrients. So I'm just going to try to make it as practical and easy as possible. So what do you need to know about first protein? The main thing to know about protein is it's the vast majority of protein is used to manufacture tissue, in particular muscle, but also hoof tissue. Um, it, it's also needed for the body to make hormones and some other, some other things as well. Um, but protein is not a readily available like energy or calorie source for the horse, so it doesn't make horses hot. And we hear this a lot, that's definitely a misnomer, so it's just not true. In terms of horses' diets, a good, even an average forage source probably provides most of the horse's protein requirements, but if the horse is, um, has increased needs, which we'll talk about on the next slide, or you have really crappy hay, you know, it may be a case where you do need to get additional protein from a, a feed, a, or to 5B, or perhaps a supplement or something of that nature. Um, the average horse in their prime probably needs about 12% total protein in the diet. Growing horses and senior horses need more, so beginning of life and end of life. Growing horses are making tissue, right, so that makes sense that they need more protein. Senior horses, they actually need more for a different reason. It's because they have a harder time digesting the protein from their diet, so some of it's getting wasted, and you may need to kind of make up the difference by eating a little bit of extra quality protein. It's one of the reasons we see seniors kind of lose their top line and have some muscle wasting. Um, they have a harder time digesting protein. Also, a hard-working horse in, in heavy training who's developing muscle may have reason to get a little bit more protein as well. Okay, let's talk about fat. The primary role of fat in the horse's diet is for calories, and then there are some particular types of fats or fatty acids that the body needs for cellular health, which we will get to. Um, Fat is the most concentrated source of energy or calories. So it's a really efficient way to get more calories in the horse. That's one reason it's great for 
card keepers or horses that have a hard time gaining or maintaining weight. The other really great thing about fat is it's also a, a cool burning energy source that won't make horses hot. So if you've heard that, I'm going to be debunking that rumor as well. Um, fats metabolize slowly. It's one of the reasons it's really ideal for um, endurance type events. Like if you had an endurance horse that had to go 50 miles or 100 miles, you would want that horse on a high fat diet because that's going to be burned slowly over the course of the day and give him more maintainable energy. Whereas if you feed him a bucket of sweet feed, which we'll talk about soon, that's all sugars and that he's going to have a big, quick spike in his blood sugar level and then a crash later and he's not going to have that, that um, sustainable energy for the day. That's also great if you have a, a horse that's working hard, burning a lot of calories, but maybe like a thoroughbred type who's going to get hot and excitable if you, if you feed him like too much sweet feed and he's going to fuck somebody off. Get that horse on a higher fat diet, you can feed less of it because it's more calorie dense and it's also cooler burning. So luckily feed companies are really getting away from kind of the old school type feeds which are loaded up in sugar and kind of low on fat and we're realizing we're just do great on a lot of fiber and great on um, quite a bit more fat than we used to think and we need to limit those sugars for most horses. Speaking of sugars, so in terms of carbohydrates there's kind of two categories, the simple carbs and the complex carbs. Simple carbs are the sugary, starchy part of the plant. You may hear your clients talking about this NSC, the ref references the non-structural carbohydrate. It's basically the sugary, starchy part of the plant. Um, just somebody trying to make it sound fancier. These are the, definitely the types of carbohydrates that need to be limited in a horse's diet. Overfeeding sugars and starches contributes to um, excitability we talked about, but also weight gain. Just like with us, eating more sugar we know makes us fat, makes our horses fat too. Um, digestive upset, overloading sugar on the stomach and the hindgut is, is not a good idea. There's a lot of digestive issues that come from that. Metabolic conditions, um, and in particular, eventually, if they continue to be fed, fed and managed that way, um, it will set the horse up for laminitis, which is obviously a con concern for you folks. So those are kind of the carbs that are not so crazy about, and these are the carbs that are good. So the structural carbohydrates the fiber, the stemmy part of the plant, that's why they're called the structural carbohydrates, is the structural part of the plant. These are critical. This goes back to the very first slide. This is, needs to be the majority of the horse's diet it needs to come from this, this type of um, feed stuff. These pass right on by the stomach and the small intestine and they get to the hindgut, the cecum and the colon. And actually the horse himself doesn't have the ability to break down fiber. It's the bacteria that live in the hindgut. They, um, they break down fiber through a process of fermentation and create a really healthy energy source for horses. So this is why um, we need to really make sure the foundation of our horse's diet is in roughage. Um, this again can come from a variety of sources and, and just plain having roughage through there, moving through all the time is really important for digestive health in general. Okay, that was the boring part. Now we're doing fun stuff, okay? So you made it through. All right, so we know that horses being too fat or too thin is, both has health, health risks, but honestly, I, I think you guys are probably dealing more frequently with, with horses that are overweight, if I had to guess. New research tells us that maybe as much as half of horses are overweight, um, and I find that horse owners often don't know how to accurately judge their horse's weight or body condition, and what they think is like, oh, he's just cute and shiny, he's actually too fat. So we're going to learn a little bit more how to do that. The um, Hennecke Body Condition Scoring System is really, I really highly recommend that you all learn how to do this. It's not hard. You can teach your clients how to do it, and then you, your horse owners, and your veter veterinarians as part of that horse's care team are all speaking the same language when it comes to talking about how much you know, fat cover that horse is carrying. So the standardized scale, one is really emaciated, two is obese. You do it by a combination of looking at the horse and also putting your hands on the horse. There's six areas of the body. You give each one of those areas a score and then you average them out. So our staff veterinary, I'm going to show you four example horses. These are horses that she actually body condition scored in person. We're just looking at them, so we're kind of cheating. But we're going to figure out where these horses land. So this is the Vinci, this is the thoroughbred, this is the four. Can last three of those? Where there's one? Oh. Shoulder and tail head. So this is the Vinci, he's a four-year-old thoroughbred. If one is emaciated and nine is obese, where do you guys think he stands? Two. Two, I got a two. Anybody else? Three. three. All right, good job. He is a three. All right, a little bit fleshier now. We're talking about furry, she's a Walter Pony. 
<laughs> what do we think about Bernie's score? <laughs> she is a seven. Good, see? Good and good already. And this is Tilly. Tilly's owned by a smart cat employee. Lovely thoroughbred mare. Five is ideal, I should have said. Five. Well, obviously the smart cat of course is the perfect one, right? All right, and one more. This is Dixie. Corridor six. She actually, so this happened in the other group. I actually initially would have maybe scored her visually with a 6 2, because she definitely looks a little fleshier than the, the red, but our veterinarian actually had her hands on her and she said her score really averaged out closer to a 5. Um, but you can see how once you learn how to do this, you, again, you have to put your hands on the horse too, but it's such a great thing. Like if you know how to do this and maybe you keep this in your notes about that horse, especially if it's one that tends to be overweight or you're dealing with laminitis issues, you guys every six weeks or however often you're there can kind of keep an eye on this. He's saying to the horse owner, no, it's looking like he's carrying a little bit more. I'm now going to score him closer to a seven. And last time I was here, he's closer to a six. We really need to be careful about what we're feeding him. So that's a really, really handy tool. I already talked a lot about the importance of forage and limiting grain. I did a lot about this in the morning session. So those of you who are here got a more in-depth review of this. But um, the deal is feed the minimum amount of grain, if any, that that horse actually needs. Start with forage and then only add grain for calories if the horse is actually working hard and burning calories or is a hard keeper who has a hard time maintaining weight. Um, in terms of evaluating the horse's overall diet, a commercial feed product can only meet the horse's full vitamin and mineral and protein requirements if the horse is feeding a full serving size according to the feed bag. And we've done a lot of surveying and found that horse owners generally don't feed that much. Like a typical serving size is up to seven pounds a day, and most people feed more like two, three, four pounds a day to the average horse. That does not mean they should feed more grain, because that's what we're talking about here, that overfeeding grain has problems. But it does mean that the vitamin and mineral um, component of their diet is lacking because they're not feeding a full serving size of that product. So they need to make up the difference on those nutrients, and that's the case where a vitamin mineral supplement or maybe a ration balancer, um, which I can talk about later if you have more questions, is an awesome, awesome choice. I'm going to keep going here. Okay, speaking of easy keepers, so we already know that a body condition of six and above is overweight. These guys are definitely at increased risk for metabolic issues and, and may result in that may eventually result in laminitis. Um, they also have the added strain on their joints and their heart and all kinds of stuff. Um, if a horse is overweight, really make sure that your, your clients have a veterinarian involved. There's probably some diagnostic work that needs to be done. That horse may need to be on prescription medication. The vet might need to be involved in a safe weight loss program, especially if laminitis has already occurred. Um, so if you're, you and the veterinarian working together as part of a team is really the best approach for these horses. And um, again, teaching those horse owners how to monitor their body condition score is, is a good idea. And hopefully you guys are also keeping a closer eye on the, on the feet of these risky, overweight, crusty neck type horses, which I'm sure you are. Also, don't feed, we talked about this, not feeding extra grain is bad for all horses. Excess grain is bad for all horses. It's especially bad for these guys. They should probably be on no grain. They definitely still need their vitamins and minerals and protein from another product. This is absolutely a place where a ration balancer or a vitamin and mineral supplement comes in. I can't tell you how many horses I have like, oh, you know, he's turned out on the fat farm and he gets two flights a day a day and that's all I get. And he's still got like lumps of fat hanging off of him and he's foundering. Well, what happens is they get in this, you know, they kind of pass this tipping point metabolically where we're kind of starving the body of not only calories but also all these critical nutrients that the um, metabolism and the immune system, frankly, needs to function properly. So, um, you know, making sure you make up the difference of those vitamins and minerals is actually a really critical component of managing these metabolic cases. Choking, soaking hay is a great way to remove sugars. Make sure they dump the water because it creates sugar water. Limit treats, um, especially sugary treats. This is a um, chart that shows us the non-structural carbohydrate um, component of some of these common feed stuffs. So this is the sugary part of the plants. Down at the bottom are the worst ones. I want to point out carrots. Um, oats are 55% or 54%, corn 73% sugar folks. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff down the bottom of this list that these easy keeper type horses should not be eating. Um, pasture considerations. Ideally, these guys shouldn't be on pasture. Granted, pasture turnout is ideal for an, a healthy horse, but um, I have an old type Morgan who is 
always on the verge of being too heavy, and I just I just don't let him have pasture anymore. He knows how to run his gra grazing muzzle off on the fence, so he doesn't get pasture anymore. Um, so you know, you just have to be really, really careful, and it's because the grass has a lot of sugar in it. If that's the only option, they definitely need a grazing muzzle. If they rub it off on the fence like my horse, I don't know, duct tape it to their face or something, because you're they're really putting their horse in danger if they let them have too much grass. Um, overnight is when the sugars are lowest, so that might be a helpful option. <coughs> don't mow these pastures. Obviously watch out for toxic plants and whatnot, but just like first cut hay is better for these horses, a weedier, stemmier pasture is a, probably, even though it doesn't seem logical, it's got more roughage and more fiber and less sugar than a mowed pasture with the fresh, young baby grasses that are high in sugars. Um, and, and don't forget that besides the spring, sugar also peaks again in the fall season. This is what the chestnut is my horse before he learned how to rub his muzzle off. And you know, he loves to tell about it, so it's not the cruelest thing in the world. Um, omega-3 fatty acids, you've probably heard a lot about. I've got to speed it up here. But um, just know that most horse diets are low in omega-3s and too high in omega-6s. And this sets the horse's body up for a state of chronic inflammation. Omega-3s are kind of hard to get, except if you have access to grass and your horse can have grass um, they can get omega-3s from grass but other than that the best way to add them to the diet is through supplementation so um, things like flaxseed chia seed and fish oil are really really good options and in fact there's some really interesting research showing that horses supplemented with flaxseed um, it had a preventive benefit in terms of preventing the onset of laminitis and that's because omega-3s are anti-inflammatory really beneficial there Supporting digestive health is a really smart thing for these horse owners to do. Colic kills more horses than anything besides old age. Um, besides colic, we're dealing with ulcers, 60% of show horses, 90% of race horses. It's, um, digestive issues are just hugely prevalent. Um, digestion, believe it or not, is highly tied to immunity. About 65 to 70% of the immune system is part of the digestive tract. So supporting healthy digestion is a really good way to also support overall health. Management practices are really management practices are really important as well. This list here that you'll when you get the slides later is has to do with managing for the proven risk factors for colic and ulcers, so that's really important. But this is definitely a place where supplements can help. There's a lot of research showing that things like prebiotics and yeast and enzymes help the digestive system better manage some stressful events that happen commonly in, in horses' lives day to day um, and help lower their risk of some of those, those situations. If you don't believe me about the supplements, here's a really boring research slide. We will go on from here. All right, so um, number eight, <laughs> make feed changes gradually. So um, this is one of the riskiest things in terms of uh, prevalence of colic. The two leading colic researchers in the world took a look at what are the things that set the horse up for colic more than anything else. And they found that any type of brain change, like changing one type to the next um, or even an amount, Increase the horse's colic risk by five times, so that gets five sad faces. Okay, any hay change surprisingly increased it even more. It was an increased risk of 10x. So that means first cut to second cut from the same field, switching from one type of grass to another, introducing alfalfa for the first time. Any and all of those changes. The reason that that's risky is that the the good bacteria that live in the hindgut and do the job of digesting fiber that we learned about earlier. They are very, very sensitive, and they get very used to digesting a very specific diet. And if a change is made really suddenly, you shock those bacteria, and they die off, and they release toxins, and all kinds of bad stuff happens. This also might be linked to some cases of laminitis as well, besides colic. They produce gas. It's just not a good thing. So you want to make changes gradually and give those bacteria time to adjust. And all the research on the boring slide previously was about how prebiotics and yeast and some of these ingredients and that you can get in supplements actually keep those bacteria healthy and support them when there's a, a fluctuation in the diet. So that's one of the reasons that keeping a horse on a digestive supplement like that is a really good idea. Salt. Horses don't get enough. Um, the maintenance requirement for any horse, even not in any work, is about an ounce of table salt a day. Um, I find far too many people just rely on a salt block alone. Really what we should be doing is top dressing the grain and providing a consistent amount of salt all the time. Um, partly because traditional salt licks are really designed for cows with rough tongues and some horses just won't use them. Then the next horse will like bite chunks off and eat the whole thing in three days. I mean, it's, it's really variable. 
Um, so it's just not a consistent way to measure their salt intake. Uh, it's important for health overall. It also keeps them drinking really, really well. Um, drinking enough water is, is one of the colic risk factors on, on the slide previously. So best practice, top dress the, with some source of salt every day so that you know the horse is getting a consistent amount. And then if you also want to provide a salt lick, I really like the Himalayan style ones. They're smoother and horses seem to like the taste better and use them more readily. And then last but not least, uh, supplements in general, besides the stuff we already mentioned for like omegas and digestive health, just don't forget that, you know, while supplements are never a replacement for good management and um, regular health care from you guys, regular care from the veterinarian, they're definitely a helpful tool in terms of managing particular health issues or maintaining health. Um, so whether it's a joint supplement, something for the hooves in particular, there's other issues. You can help with muscle issues, respiratory issues. There's a lot of products out there that, that are quite beneficial. So you know, keep those in the back of your mind if you, if you come across um, issues in a horse that are not being you know, successfully managed otherwise. There might actually be a supplement that help in smart pack is certainly um, chat with you or chat with your client about that. So um, this is just a nice example of a recent success story. We got this woman actually got this horse through the Mustang makeover and or took him through the Mustang makeover competition. And I just think he's lovely. A lot of Mustangs are really overweight and he's in a really nice body condition. And although, you know, yes, wild horses survive and do fine on their rough and tumble life. I bet you've never seen a Mustang look this good, so I just thought it was a pretty remarkable picture. And he's on a supplement program from Smart Pack and did really well in the Mustang makeover. Um, I will say that supplements can't turn horses into circus ponies, though. So they just have to be really cute and smart like mine to know how to do this. So, yeah.